Good morning to you. If you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 1, I'll be reading most of that text today. I apologize now for my voice. I've been struggling with a respiratory infection. Um, probably since Tuesday night, we were in Cincinnati, out of town, and um, I couldn't get to a doctor till Friday, so um, this is the best I've felt in several days, so just be here with me, please. My wife and I live in the Forest Hill subdivision off of St. Andrew's Church Road, and we've enjoyed our neighbors through the years. Some of them have uh, moved on, and we, we've missed them uh, since they have. Uh, but we've grown fond to, the, to those that have replaced them. I saw it was great when you could look around and say you had good neighbors. And um, people that look after you and you look after them. But about six years ago, two thieves broke into a house on a nearby street, took a laptop, computer, and some other valuables. And uh, this led to a meeting to form a block watch um, on our streets. And uh, several people were willing to do that, mixture kind of retired people that were home a lot during the day and other people were home in the evenings. And I think it's helped make our neighborhood safer. But from that, um, this led to the forming of a neighborhood community uh, where we could work together for the good of our subdivision. It's called the Forest Hills Community. A board was nominated and elected uh, to meet monthly and evalu evaluate neighborhood needs and how to best meet them. And the group originally set voluntary dues at $60 a year uh, the cover expenses for getting uh, more street lights to discourage crime, uh, to keep our sub subdivision interests looking nice um, for potential home buyers, and to have funds to clean our streets of snow and ice in the winter months. I've served on this board for the last five years, several years as treasurer, and this past year as vice president. And for the second year, we're finding that there aren't enough interested people to fill the open board slots. Um, people tell us things like they're too busy with other things, and undoubtedly some of them are in that season of life where that is very true for them. But I think just some want to enjoy the benefits um, harvested by the board's work without really sharing in the responsibilities. And others I found through talking to them just want to complain about things that they don't like in the subdivision without really wanting to take an active part in bringing positive changes. And I have to admit, there's times it gets a little frustrating. Um, people willing uh, to find people um, to take on the leadership responsibilities where the needs exist. And I realize there's a lot of people that live in our subdivision and do a lot of good. But it kind of reminds me when I think about that of what often happens in the churches today. Um, I've talked to, I talked to a lot of preachers I have this week. I have often uh, in meetings with different ones about different things in our city. And all of them share pretty much the same concern. Uh, there's just uh, not enough people to step into to leadership positions. And not only is there a need for more men to serve as elders, elders and deacons, but there's so many areas of ministry that need someone, men and women, to take on leader responsibilities for the good of our children, our youth, and our adults and to help our community, businesses, and homes understand the great truth that Jesus came to bring to this world that the church, uh, Jesus intends for us to share. But often more openings and willing people to fill them. And for some, the reasons I mentioned earlier with my neighborhood group, plate too full to serve already, just not willing to take the responsibility to make a difference. And often it's because of that, it, it, it makes it difficult for churches to meet all the ministry needs that they have. I just want to say a word to those that are serving in leadership positions right now. Um, you know, God is really uh, asking you to make ripples that positively influence the world for Christ, whether you be recognized leaders or your teachers or your workers in some way in this church. There's a number of you uh, sitting out here today. You're doing a great job. Uh, just know that the things that you're doing are impacting other people, whether you see it or not, and uh, keep doing a great job that you are. For those of you who don't consider yourself leaders, realize that leadership is not always an upfront position. It doesn't always mean leading um, dozens or even hundreds of people. Um, 
the leaders can serve and be over one person or a small group of children. There's just so many ways that people that step into leadership positions serve. Leaders teach our classes. Make sure we have people filling our communion cups. Make sure we have nursery and preschool positions filled every Sunday. Making sure their team members arrive on time to clean the building or mow the yard. And the list just goes on and on. The tasks aren't always real large, but certainly they're all important. And I just appreciate people that step into those. And I think there's always a challenge for people who haven't yet to consider doing that. We're going to be talking in this series about Peter and his development as a worker and a leader for Jesus. And there was really nothing spectacular about Peter when he met Jesus. He was just simply an ordinary blue-collar fisherman who went to work every day, completed his task for the day, and he went home. And he lived a very average life as, as a Jewish man in the town in which he lived. But Jesus came to him and said, Peter, I have so much more in mind for you than for you simply to fish for fish. I see in you a man who can fish for men and women and children. And God saw things in Peter that Peter didn't see. And Peter wanted to argue with Jesus about that. But certainly Jesus saw more in him than he saw. And I think it's important for you and I because often the Lord sees so much more in us than we see in ourselves. And we're just like Peter. If God can use Peter, maybe God can use you. He can use me. We know that three days after his crucifixion, Jesus rose from the grave and was seen by hundreds of witnesses over the course of the next 40 days. And after appearing to different people over this time period, Jesus explained that he was returning to the Father, but he was not going to leave his disciples alone. He promised a comforter that would help the disciples in the task of evangelizing the world. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And then verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of of the earth. When Christ ascended to his father, the next step for the disciples was to wait. It was to simply wait. Nobody likes to wait. I don't know if there's anyone in this room today that just loves to wait. We don't like to wait for results from the doctor. We don't like to wait for the elevator, for traffic to move, for the train to go by, for people to make decisions that you and I feel like we could make instantly. These are all things we end up waiting on, and it drives us nuts. But this is what the disciples were called to do. They were called to put their lives on pause and to wait for when the Lord knew the time was best for the next thing. A later verse in Acts 1 tells us how they spent their time. <clears throat> in verse 14, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So the time that they had, they spent praying. What a great encouragement to us when we have to wait. But a big transition takes place beginning in verse 15 as we find Peter stepping up to take a leading part. Verse 15, in those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus he was one of our number and shared in this ministry. Verse 20. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place. Peter quotes there two 
Old Testament prophecies that had been fulfilled. And either he had an incredible understanding and knowledge of Old Testament scriptures or the Lord's uh, prompted him that those words were prophecies concerning Judas. And it was probably a combination of both. And wanting to follow the scriptures, Peter goes on to say in verse 21, Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. I think it's significant here that Peter gives a very honest evaluation. He doesn't candy coat or sweep under the rug what Judas has done. He hit this head on and he simply said we need to replace him because that's what the scriptures require us to do. And we need to keep the bar just as high for this position as has always been and make sure that people understand that the person filling this gap has been around all the way back from John's baptism to the time of Christ's ascension. <clears throat> the group moved forward, beginning in verse 23. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. They cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias so he was added to the 11 apostles. <clears throat> the casting of lots back then was an intricate form of making decisions much today like we would flip a coin or draw a straw. But in the Old Testament, the lot was often used to select people for special responsibilities because it was always divinely guided by God's sovereignty. Over 20 different times in the Bible, we find people casting lots in some form, but notice this item of interest. Because chronologically, this is the very last time in the Bible that the phrase casting lots is ever mentioned. You ever wonder why? Well, the answer is found in the very next paragraph as Acts 2 begins. The Holy Spirit arrived on the scene. And it's no coincidence that there is an abrupt ending to chance determining decisions because God is sending the Holy Spirit to guide his people. Well, Peter began to lead, but how did this moment develop? That's what we like to talk about today and over the next several weeks. If you're following on your outline today, the first point is a leader goes through a period of instruction for important tasks. A leader goes through a period of instruction. Throughout the Gospels, we find Jesus teaching the disciples constantly. We see them hungry for teaching. In Luke 17, 1, we find them asking Jesus to teach them to pray. And a good leader wants to be taught. There is a hunger to grow and to learn. And those who think they know it all may succeed for a short term. But those who are lifetime learners continue to rise to the top over and over because they are aware that there's always more to learn. They're humble to learn and they know that the world is always changing. So if a leader goes through a period of teaching, but also there was training. Jesus gave the disciples responsibilities and roles to fulfill. He gave them firsthand experience and hands-on training. Some of you may remember when Howard, Howard Snellenberger was coaching the University of Louisville football team many years ago. And he always started his second string quarterback in the second quarter. And he did this 
just because he wanted to get him a few snaps. He was getting him ready, building up his confidence, helping him to be ready in case he was ever called upon. But he always took the first series or two in the second quarter to play his second string quarterback for that very purpose. He was training him, gave him a chance to get real action, hands-on experience, and to learn from his mistakes. Jesus trained his disciples. He set the example for them. He developed their gifts and he empowered them through the Spirit of God. And we find a couple of occasions in the Gospels where he sent them out two by two. And he did this because he wanted them to get experience. He wanted them to go out and to, and to make some mistakes. But he sent them out to represent him, to teach and to spread his love, and certainly um, to perform some miracles. But the thing is, when you send people out, when they've been taught and they've been trained a little bit, you don't really know how it's going to go for them. There's an element of trust that's involved. And people are not perfect, and we will all make mistakes. But we gain some experience from being trusted to go out and do something. We had a little store not too far down Newcut when I was growing up. And I remember my mom giving me a $5 bill to go down to the store. And I came here if I was supposed to buy eggs or bread or something. I don't know if you remember this, Mom, but I lost the money on the way to the store. And maybe it was just something to see if I was ready for that kind of responsibility. Obviously, I wasn't. Um, but it was a time of trusting me and allowing me to try something. And I learned to hang on to money a little tighter after that day because I was terribly embarrassed and hated to go home and tell my mom what I had done. But you know, it's through those experiences where we learn, we learn to trust and we learn from our mistakes. Maybe you've heard about the teenage boy who had landed his first job and he worked as a, a delivery boy for a florist. And everything was going so well for him. And, but there came this one day when he had two deliveries on one run. And one was to a new church that had moved into a larger worship center and they were having their dedication and the other was to a funeral home. And a few hours later, the head florist received a phone call from an irate preacher who was screaming in the phone, we got a problem. And the florist said, well, what's the problem? And the preacher said, we got a brand new worship center dedication in 30 minutes. And right up on the front of our podium, there are flowers that say, rest in peace. The floor said, you think you've got problems. Somewhere in this town next to a casket, there's a set of flowers that say, good luck in your new location. <clears throat> I'm so glad that God is so much more concerned about our direction than our perfection. He's much more interested in your direction than your perfection. Because God is able to use your failures to accomplish his tasks through teaching, training, and trusting. Next point in your outline, be open to God's calling in your life. Be open to God's calling in your life. Peter knew that when Jesus approached him for the first time, he was an illogical choice to lead anything. And he couldn't believe that Jesus wanted him to lead people for him. Peter just couldn't see himself doing anything like that. All he knew how to do was fish. Any formal education, any public speaking classes. He was never up in front of people proclaiming anything. But here Jesus was saying, Peter, you've been fishing for fish. You're great at it. But I want you to fish for people. And you're going to do a great job. And even though Peter didn't believe probably the Lord that day, he was still open to do anything that Jesus thought he could do. And I think that is an incredible, humble spirit that all of us need to have. You know, even after he failed Jesus later in his ministry by betraying him, Jesus made sure that Peter understood that he was more interested in direction than perfection. I love a quote I saw uh, this week from Bob Benson, who uh, passed away several years ago. He was a Nazarene preacher, a great writer. 
But he wrote, so I understand easily why it appears that I am both an implausible and a logical choice. I can only say that if it seems that way to those who only know me a little bit, how much more does it seem to me knowing all that I know about me? But fortunately, my being chosen does not grow out of me. I'm just a choosy. <laughs> Bob makes a great point. The people that don't know us real well think we're up to something. Even when we know a lot about ourselves and don't think we are, the important thing is we were chosen, we were selected. And often God has a hand in that. And it's so very important that we consider those things carefully and be open to God's calling in our lives. Next point is to pray for God's direction. To pray for God's direction. <clears throat> There are two different times in Acts 1 where it emphasizes that the disciples prayed constantly and they prayed for discernment. And I think they understood the importance of replacing Judas with the right person and knowing God's leading to do the right thing. And they understood that this was something they needed to continue to do. It's not just I'll pray for you and then there's just one prayer, but they understand this was something they needed to continue to do. And many of the choices that, that we make not only affect our lives, but they affect the lives of the people around us. And I think the disciples knew this, and they wanted God's guidance for daily decisions. And it's so important that we understand that as well. The decisions that I make, and this is a humbling thing to really stop and think about. It doesn't just affect my life. It affects my wife, my family, and even things I think they don't know. It's going to affect their lives uh, in some way or another. It affects my family at large and my extended family. It affects you as members of my church family and, and my friends. It's so important to realize that so often those decisions that I make have a, a wide-ranging ripple effect. And they need to be made carefully. And they need to be bathed in prayer. Prayer is so important when we're asked to step into a task that affects us and other people. And it's important that when you feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of you know what I'm talking about. When you feel the nudge of the Holy Spirit. Don't ignore it. Pray about it. Take it to him in prayer. Ask him what it means. And follow up on what is revealed to you. Pray for his direction. And lastly, be willing to make your life count for Jesus. Be willing to make your life count for Jesus. What an unlikely leader Peter was. And yet he said, Lord, in spite of all my failures, in spite of all the times I put my foot in my mouth, in spite of the fact I know I'll disappoint you, I put my life in your hands to use me. I think that's such a great attitude because Peter did those things. Here's times he failed. There's times he put his foot in his mouth. There's times he did disappoint the Lord. But he made himself readily available to be used of God because he knew God was more interested in direction than perfection. You know, the church is the only organization that Jesus set up while he was on the earth. The church is extremely important to him. And so it's important for you and I as members of the church, those of you who are in that category today, that we need to be regular in our attendance so that we can be taught and fed God's word. Because he is teaching us and wanting to train us. And we need to find an area or two where we have interest or experience that can be used for the church and then we need to always pray about every opportunity that comes our way and ask, is this something that we need to do? Is this something we could recruit somebody else to do? Or is there something I need to give up in order to do this because it is more important? It's important to let our lives count for Jesus in powerful ways. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for the challenge of stepping up in our lives I 
because we know that the church is always in need of people to step up and help. People to be willing to step up and take some form of leadership. And Father, none of us feel like good candidates. All of us can easily point to someone else and say they would be so much better than I am. And granted, there are times it's not a wise thing for us. Sometimes we're not qualified for a position. Sometimes we just need to grow more. But Father, there's something for all of us to do. And we didn't um, come and we're added to this family because, Father, just because we were here to receive, but we're here to also share. And that's the give and take of life, and it's just so important in the, in the church and in so many ways, but the church is so significantly important. And I just thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this church family. As I look into the faces of brothers and sisters today, I just, I just thank you, Father, for each life. For those who are leaders, may they be encouraged. And for those, Father, who have stepped back for a while and understand that too. But we still always have so many more openings, Father, than all we have willing workers. Bless those, Father, who are trying to carry ten items because simply there's not others to step up and help. But Father, I wish the load were shared more evenly. But I just pray as we look to this series, Father, we're not here to browbeat each other. We're simply here to grow and understand how you develop leadership, small or large. And there's a wonderful pattern that you've led Peter through. And I just pray through this series we understand the important development of a leader. And we might make ourselves ready for whatever you have in mind for us. Because that's really the most important thing. So I thank you, Father, for the challenge and the encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, I invite you to do that today. If you're looking for a church family, we'd love to have you here as part of the Kenwood Heights family. If you have a public decision, I'll be down front to greet you. If you like speaking to the service in the back, I'll be happy to do that as well. Would you stand with us as we worship?